In December of 1606, three ships sailed from England to the New World, carrying over 100 men and boys. They were sent by the Virginia Company, and one of their main goals was to find riches to send back to London. In the spring of 1607, they searched for a settlement site and chose a small island up the James River where they built a fort. It was to become the first permanent English settlement in this new world. And in honor of their king, they called it Jamestown. Jamestown. I've got to finish this research paper. Whoa! There should be something good in here. Are you ready to hear a tale about adventure and disaster and incredible courage? Do you want to hear what happened to the people of Jamestown? Whoa. It's like this guy is talking to me. I am talking to you. How can you do that? Where are you anyway? I'm here at the Jamestown Settlement Museum. Come on over and we'll tell you a tale that you may not have heard before. Oh, sure. How do you expect me to do that? Oh, this is the internet. Go anywhere you want. Yeah, sure. Whoa! Awesome! Is this really Jamestown Settlement? Well, we're next door to the historic site. This is a recreation of the fort as it was described about 1610. That's about three years after the first settlers get here. Now, what do you want to know about Jamestown? Well, I was wondering what something about 400 years old has anything to do with me. Well, tell me what language are you speaking? Well, English, of course. Uh, just assume for a moment that Jamestown never existed. We could be speaking Spanish today. You know, Spain lays claim to this entire uh, continent here, what the Europeans will call the New World. Uh, and the English instructions are to sail far enough upriver here to maintain a defensible position against the Spanish. It's uh, recognizable by this time that there's no longer a war between Spain and England, but the two nations aren't on any friendly terms. And as a matter of fact, Jamestown is the first permanent English settlement here in the, in the New World. And as a result of that, it really does have a lasting influence on the culture of our country. That's why English is our primary language today. Well, it's nice to know about our language, but what was that about incredible courage and adventure? Well, do you like to take trips? Well, we went to Disney World last year. That was fun. Yeah, but this is a different kind of trip. Awesome, we're on a ship. Well, how would you like to be down below here for almost Oh, five months with 53 other guys. I don't think so. Well, you're below decks here, the Susan Constant. That's one of the three ships that brings those Englishmen over here in 1607. 104 of them looking for that uh, mineral wealth and that Northwest Passage, some route to China and the great wealth of the Orient. Yeah, that's pretty cool, but uh, where are the beds? And the kitchen? And the bathroom? Whoa. Oh, good day to you. Welcome aboard, Susan Constant. I'm the bosun here aboard. You've come through my cabin already. The kitchen's up above there as well. Uh, that's your bunk behind you there. Pull back the curtain and crawl in. See if you think it's comfortable or not. Get a feel for it. You'll be living there on the way across the ocean. To endure and suffer. It's a hard cabin, cold and salt meat, broken sleeps, moldy bread, dead beer, wet clothes, and want of fire. Did you guys hear that? There's this guy talking about moldy bread and wet clothes and want of fire. Yep. You certainly want a fire down here. This is a pretty dreary place to live. All your food's packed down here. It's all packed below. Salt and meats, pickled fish, grains, cheese and biscuit. A lot of beer and cider to wash it down. We don't carry very much water aboard ship. 
It'll get contaminated too very easily. Pickled fish? Ew, smelly. How'd they stand it down here? Well, the ocean crossing was, uh, was very tough. Some would bring things for them to amuse themselves, you know, like a game of cards or perhaps some checkers or dominoes. There were those who uh, brought musical instruments with them who could uh, entertain the rest of the people. But this was a, a very boring trip with so many men crammed into a small area. Were there only men? That's right. Well, there were only men because this was a business venture. It wasn't a safe place for families at the time. What you had was men coming over here looking for some type of profit. Uh, what, what do you think they'd be looking for? Well, probably gold and silver. Gold, silver, copper, lead, iron, any kind of mineral wealth. Anything that they could use to, to turn a profit with. You have a group of investors back in England who have organized themselves into a company they call the Virginia Company. They asked the king for permission to come over here and establish this settlement that you, that you have here. Of course, now, once they get here, you have to build a fort, like you see here. Who do you think they want to protect themselves from? The Indians. Yeah, well, they came to trade with the natives. What they're really concerned about are the Spanish. They'll build the fort here when they get here. That's going to take a lot of work. They brought over a lot of craftsmen and laborers, but most of the men who came here in that first year were gentlemen. They were friends of the investors. They wanted to come over here and share in the profits themselves. A lot of those men didn't have the kind of skills that would be needed to build this type of a fort, so they probably weren't doing that kind of, that kind of hard work that would be done here. This doesn't sound very fair. Well, that's true. There was a lot of dissension among them in the first year. Matter of fact, they couldn't even agree among themselves as to who should be the council president. I know about one man who was a council member who was actually executed because they believed him to be treacherous. They thought he might be a Spanish spy. It's the blacksmith who tries to save his own life by reporting that plot. Now, if you go over to Jamestown Island today, you can actually see uh, the remains of one of the settlers. The skeletons scare you? No way. Wow, who's this guy? This is JR102C. JR stands for Jamestown Rediscovery. That's the archaeological excavation where we, where we dug him up. We're not sure exactly who he was. We know that he was buried there almost 400 years ago. So how old was he? Well, he was probably about 18 to 20 years old. And they can tell that from features, uh, particularly in the teeth. His, uh, his wisdom teeth wouldn't have come in until his late teen years. You might wonder why such a young guy died, right? Well, he was shot in the leg, and the bullet still remains there. It was a, was a real bad shot, and we know there was no sign of healing there, and no sign that anyone tried to get that lead out or to set the leg. And that's actually the back of his leg. It was broken so badly that it was twisted all the way around. He would have, would have died from loss of blood. We didn't find any other injuries on him. We're not sure how he was shot, whether it was just an accident, one of the guys marching behind him, accidentally shot him in the leg, whether he could have possibly even done that to himself while trying to load his gun. And there's, of course, always the chance that somebody shot him on purpose. This would have been a very hard life for a young man like this who probably got on a ship in England to come over here. He might not have known exactly what he was in for, and it was a, was a tough time for everybody living here at Jamestown. So, what do you think? Not such a fun place. No, it's difficult to survive here. What are some of the basic things you're going to need to survive? Well, you're going to need something to eat and going to need a roof so you don't get rained on. Food and shelter, but also one more thing, too. Water. Our drink was cold water taken out of the river at a low tide full of slime and filth. 
paid to drink this stuff? Well, they're digging shallow wells on the edge of the swamp. And so the swamp water is seeping into the wells, fouling the wells. And there's going to be a problem because they're going to be drinking a lot of water because of the intense heat of the summer months. They must have gotten really sick. Well, they do. They got another problem also from the river. The river's a mix of the salt and the fresh. So they're going to wind up having the seepage of that salty water, that brackish water, into the, their wells as well. That salt poisoning is going to make them susceptible to a lot of these diseases. Our men were destroyed with cruel diseases, the swellings, fluxes, burning fevers. They have another problem as well. The English are going to suffer from starvation. Our food was but a small can of barley sod in water to five men a day. Sounds awful. Our conditions were awful here. In the first five months, over half of the men were dead. They had problems with their leadership. Uh, men weren't motivated anymore. Well, if everything was so bad, why didn't they just go back to England? Well, they didn't have any way to get back there. The Susan Constant and the Godspeed had already sailed back to England to get resupply. They had to wait for the next resupply ships to arrive. Uh, they were stuck here with just bad water, with uh, little food. There was dissension among themselves. They had this constant fear of a Spanish attack. The English had one other thing to fear, too. More? Yes, from out there. June 8th, Monday. Master Clover died. That was shot with six arrows sticking in it. The Indians? Powhatans. The English called them savages. But the Powhatans didn't think much more of the English. Well, why didn't they like each other? Well, they didn't really understand each other. Well, I've heard of the Sioux and the Apache, but never the Powhatans. The Powhatans were gardening people that lived in the eastern part of Virginia. 32 tribes of people are unified by Wahoon Sunnecock, their leader, that the English called Powhatan. He pulled them together into one powerful unit, 15,000 strong. You want to go see him? Sure. Let's go. This is a recreated Powhatan village. Powhatan lived in towns that might have 50 or 60 people in four or five related families. Their houses were described by the English as woven rushes tied to sapling frameworks. Their towns were right along rivers, and they would use those rivers to access the resources. Hey, what are you doing? I'm making a canoe out of a cypress log. The Powhatans would set a small fire on the log, and then they'd move the fire away and chip away at the charcoal that was created by that fire. You want to try it? Sure. Use an oyster shell to chip the charcoal. It's kind of hard work, isn't it? Yeah. Is that a Powhatan house? It sure is. Why don't we go see it? You'll want to stay low. Sit on the furs, maybe. Sure is nice and warm in here, even if it is a little smoky. John Smith visited in a house like this in 1608, and he described the interior as a warm, dry, smoky place. This would be a house for a family of, oh, maybe eight or 10 people, a big family. Everybody would live inside a house like this even the children? Sure. Children would sleep on the floor on furs, and moms and dads would sleep on these benches along the walls, wrapped up in deer skins for blankets. What's she doing? The soup is ready. Oh, she's preparing a meal. There's corn, beans, and squash, and meats, turkey, and venison. The Powhatan were gardeners. They'd have big fields as much as an acre for each person in a village like this. The Powhatan's gardening was really important to the English because they could supply corn and beans from the fields. They uh, understood that there could be lots of good things that would come from the soil. They wondered why the English weren't able to feed themselves. Is that why they didn't get along? 
That's one reason. But there were times when they did get along, and sometimes they didn't. They each had things that the other one wanted. What did the Indians need that the English had? Oh, think about metal knives and axes for cutting down trees. When the English bring axes in, it would make their preparation of the fields much easier. The English had something else they wanted. The English had guns, and the natives wanted them. So, if the Powhatans had food, and the English had tools and guns and stuff, where's the problem? Just trade. The English came for trade. But you have to understand, when two cultures don't understand each other, it won't be too long before neither one trusts the other. That's what brings about that story about Pocahontas saving John Smith's life. You mean she wasn't just a cartoon character? Oh, no, she was really the daughter of the Powhatan. He's the, she's the chief of all those tribes. So, she's real, but did she really save some English guy's life? Well, that English guy's Captain John Smith, and according to him, and he's the only source we have on the story, she really did. She stopped, stepped in and kept Powhatan's uh, warriors from uh, clubbing him to death. Some people now realize that uh, Powhatan uh, and the Powhatan people did seem to respect Smith. It's among his own people he had some problems. He was vain, arrogant, egotistical. You know what I mean by those words. He really was a, a man who was tough enough to keep everybody else alive, though. And he's the one who imposed some discipline in the earlier years. He says, he who shall not share in the work, neither shall they share in the food. You've heard that? Yeah, yeah. You don't work, you don't eat. That's the way we've learned it. And he's also been responsible for some other efforts, too, to try to figure out some other way to turn a profit. He's the one that's going to organize the cutting down of the timber for sending wood back to England, be involved with soap ash and potash making, uh, silkworm farming, and glass blowing. Now, we've actually found the ruins of the uh, first glass house over on Glass House Point, and that's run by the National Park Service today. Uh, can you tell this young man why they might have been uh, trying to blow glass here? Well, they found all the basic ingredients here for glass. They had uh, sand, potash, soda ash, and lime. So how do these ingredients make glass? Well, the basic ingredient, which is sand, melts at about 3,400 degrees. And then when you add the other ingredients, the melting point drops to about 1,400 degrees. And that enables us to make pieces like this, or goblets, or drinking glasses, or whatever functional things they needed. So what happened to all these glass blowers? Well, they all died of disease and from Indian arrows. So you can see that the first glass blowing effort's only gonna last for about one year. So what happened? Well, they still continued to try to figure out a way to turn a profit. Um, they kept bringing over more men to take the place of those that died. Death rate's real high here. They're dying of dysentery, typhoid fever. And they're always dying of Indian arrows. Won't be too long before uh, they'll be in total war with the natives. So if everyone was fighting, what happened to Pocahontas? Well, she winds up with one of the tribes in the northern area here. Uh, the English find her up there, kidnap her, bring her back down here to Jamestown. Hold her for ransom. Hey, I thought there weren't women in Jamestown. Oh. There were a few women here at Jamestown, and even a few children. Some men paid extra to bring members of their families with them. But I think if they'd known how hard life would be for them here, they might have left their families back home. It was a hard life here. There were lots of rules. They issued the laws, divine, moral, and martial. If you took food from the storehouse, if you spoke out against the governor, they could put you to death. Poor Pocahontas. This doesn't sound like a great place to be in prison. Well, actually, Pocahontas found a home here in Jamestown. She learned to speak English, and she even married an Englishman named John Rolfe. Well, he was the man who finally figured out a way to make a profit for the company. But I thought there was no gold. Well, there wasn't any gold, but here, take a look over here. Smell this. 
What's that smell like to you? I have no clue. This is tobacco. This is a dried tobacco leaf. They call it the golden weed. They came looking for what? Gold. No, well, they found the gold in the gold leaf of tobacco. People are getting extremely rich off of this stuff. King James personally hated tobacco, but the crown was even making money off of it through taxes. But tobacco takes a lot of labor. It's very labor intensive. So the company decides to send over indentured servants in order to, to take care of that labor. Indentured? What does that mean? Well, kind of, it's kind of like a contract. Let's say that I indenture myself uh, to you, or how about better yet, you indenture yourself to me for anywhere from three to seven years. In exchange for that, I'd be obligated to give you some type of training, perhaps, but I'd have to give you food, clothing, a place to sleep. We're on the verge of starvation. My master Atkins have sold me for 150 pounds sterling, like a slave. Were indentured servants slaves? No, not really. There's a term limit on the indenture. The, at the end of that certain term period, then they'd be free. The real problem is going to be that what they expected to find when they got here, when they were volunteering for this indenture to come here, wasn't what, uh, what they'd hoped. They're finding death. They're finding disease. They're finding warfare. Of the thousands of people who come here, six out of every seven men will have died. Thousands of men dying. Thousands of men died? I can't even imagine that much. There was a great deal of tragedy here not only for the English who get here, but also for the Indians whose, whose lands are taken over just so that we can grow this tobacco. And there was another group of people that really didn't want to be here at all. You'll see the first Africans arriving here, coming off of a, a Dutch man of war where they were captured from a Spanish ship. When they were brought here, they were probably indentured here. But it won't be too long before we'll start to see an institutional form of slavery, chattel slavery, where men will be born into slavery here. Isn't there anything we can be proud of here? Oh, certainly. Of course there is. Come with me. Well, there is something to be proud of, something that happens here in this church in 1619. By that time, we will have had a new form of government. Uh, the new governor arrives here with a new charter. You know that old charter we had authorizing martial law where soldiers would be in charge of the settlement? Well, that's fine as long as we're at war with the natives, but after 1614, we're at peace and yet we're still running the place like a military post. Well, when the new governor in 1619 comes, he winds up having two men from each of the 11 plantations and towns meet here in this church in 1619 to pass laws on the running of the colony. What would you call those men? Representatives. Representatives. That's kind of what they were doing. They were representing each of the 11 plantations that they came from and towns. Well, the kind of government we have today. Our Congress, our state representatives, governments, all based on what happened here in Jamestown. Here, this is our heritage, it begins here. Whoa! Hey, Mom, guess what I just saw? 